Well, thank you for joining us for worship today. It's good to have you all with us. Uh, if you uh, have raised kids, then you're probably keenly aware that one of the greatest perils of parenting is stepping on a, a Lego, a, a room full of Legos even, especially in the dark. You just know there is nothing quite like that experience. It gets your attention, and of course, you still take another step only to have it get your attention again, and then it happens time and then time, and you're like, wait, well, why does this keep happening? Why, why, why of all the things you leave out, these little sharp cubed objects seem to dig so nicely in the bottom of my foot? What, why, right? Well, it's nothing compared to what happened not too long ago in Virginia. Uh, in Virginia, there was a Durango uh, going down the interstate that had two massive bins of Legos on top, and they blew off, and the Legos went all over the highway, covering the highway, causing now uh, hours of traffic, up to two hours of traffic as they were trying to pick up their Legos. This 11-year-old boy, it was his Legos that mom decided to strap to the top of the car. He was so distraught, right? His lifetime collection of Legos, uh, he was able to recover almost 5,000 of them. That's impressive. But the rest of them impaled themselves into the front of cars and windshields and on down the way. It was quite a mess to clean up. I think about messes. I think about the things that happen in our life. That highway looks a little bit like my family room this week. I mean, we have messes that we have to clean up, but there are often messes we have to clean up emotionally and spiritually because we've done something that did not please the Lord. And no doubt, what we see in today's passage is a massive spill all over the highway kind of mess. And we have the tendency to make decisions that have consequences. If the book of Judges hasn't made that clear to you, if scripture as a whole hasn't made that clear to you, then let me stand here today and remind you the decisions you make have consequences. They can be positive or they can be negative. But the negative ones come from you, Christian, choosing to live a godless life instead of a godly life. If you don't know Christ here today, I'm going to speak mostly to those of us who have put our faith in Jesus Christ. But listen, it's not to exclude you. I want you to know Christ. I want you to have a relationship with him. Today I'm going to explain a godly life or a godless life, and perhaps you're sitting here today saying, I don't have a relationship with God, and then so I would put you more in the godless life. You don't have a relationship with God, and that, my friends, is a collision course with your Creator, and I want nothing more than to get you off of that and into a place of having a godly life. Many of us have followed Christ for most of our lives in this room. We have lots of long-term believers in Jesus Christ in here. What does it look like for you to make sure that you continue on the path of godliness, not godlessness? I've entitled my message that today, Godly or Godless. And there's three main characters that we'll see in this passage as we continue our study in Judges. Micah, Micah's mom, and the Danites. So I call this Micah, mom, and the Danites. Godly or Godless. Before we turn to the passage that I want to show you, let's just define terms right up front. What first is godly? What does it mean for us to live a godly life? This is the Josh Weidman definition of godly. It is a lifestyle of loyalty and faithfulness to God and his ways. Loyalty, saying I'm all in, I'm not going to wane from you, though at times I might be tempted, though my desires might tell me I should walk away from you, Lord, you have my heart. Take and seal it. It is yours. Loyal to him and faithful, not only to him, but also his ways and his desires, his will. The Bible tells us all sorts of things that we should do, the way we should live, what the will of God, the desires of God are. A godly person strives to hold those up in their life. That's the positive. On the other hand is the negative. A godless life, I would define this way. It is a lifestyle void of God and disobedient to his desires. Again, desires could also be will. We think of desires as fleeting, surface level. But the Bible, when it talks about God's desires, his desires demand obedience. And a godless life is one who says, I don't want anything to do with God. And I don't want anything to do with uh, his desires or his will for my life. I'm going to live the way I want to live. That, my friends, is a collision course with the Almighty. That is a godless life. 
Let me show you this from Scripture. Open up your Bibles with me to the book of Judges. We're going to continue our series here in chapter 17 and 18 today. We've been unpacking this for several months now, understanding what has happened in this 350-year period of Israel's history and how they continued down a path of destruction because of their godlessness. The last time we were together in the book of Judges, we looked at the second half of Samson's story. His story is not one to be idolized. It's not one to look at and go, wow, I wish I was more like Samson. No, he was full of revenge. He was full of self-indulgence, gave himself over to a prostitute, found himself with the fourth woman in his life, Delilah, who tricked him four different times, finally cutting his hair and him losing his blessing of the father. Somebody in our congregation, unnamed, you don't sign your postcards to me, but you've been sending me postcards through this series. I love this one. Pastor Josh, great series on the judges. Look forward to hearing more about Samson. This was a couple weeks ago. I got a haircut the other day, and I felt like I lost my superpowers. <laughs> I love that. And this one, talking about not being distracted or devoted. I, I love these. I love these kind of things. I'm glad you're thinking about the scriptures, and you're thinking about these stories by no means is the story of Samson telling you to not get a haircut, but it is telling you to not be on this kind of collision course with God. He had clear commands from God in his conception to live a life that was set apart. And in his death, he ends in this suicidal, homicidal uh, scene at the end of Judges chapter 16, trying to pay back his enemies. Samson truly was a semi-truck spill of a life all over the highway of God's commands. He did not obey. Godless. Well, let's just real quick, before we jump into today's passage, think about a few of the other judges that we've run into. We had Ehud, uh, this left-handed judge, who I identify with because of his left-handedness, but hopefully would never want to be like because he was deceptive. Or Barak, who was so fearful and forewent the blessing of God on his life to fight the enemy. Or Gideon, who was skeptical and hubristic, who was prideful and seemingly was not someone to be idolized. Or Abimelech, who was just downright bloodthirsty, trying to kill as many people as he could. You had Jephthah, who was this manipulator, daughter, sacrificer, did all sorts of things evil in the eyes of God. Samson, as I mentioned, ungodliness off its chain. And yet all of these judges lead us now to what is the final part of this book, the epilogue. The epilogue is the end from 17 through 21. Some stories to help us understand how we got to such a train wreck. The story that we're going to look at today is about corrupt leaders, and truly, we've seen throughout this whole book, corrupt leaders lead to a corrupt culture. I consider myself senior pastor of Grace Chapel, but I will often say that I am also the CCO, which means chief cultural officer. I have to watch the culture of our church. I'm constantly thinking about the culture of our staff, the culture of our people, the culture of our members. How are we functioning as a people group, glorifying God in the relationships that we have? These leaders that we see in Judges were not CCOs by any means. They were corrupt through and through, not watching their culture and their corrupt leadership led to a corrupt culture. This is true in businesses. This is true in our nation. This is true in societies. This can be true even in churches. If the leader is corrupt, then the culture will be corrupt. So the reason I mention that is we are now at the end of the book of Judges, but what's happening here is the author is actually going back in time. He's introducing us to what happened prior to all of the Judges that we've learned about. The stories that we're looking at today and in the next couple of weeks are, are stories that would have happened in like 1340 BC, prior to all of the Judges that we've already learned about. It's as if the author does this kind of authorial, poetic, storytelling kind of thing to say, okay, I'm going to paint this really bad picture for you. Now let me show you where it all began. 
Let me show you how they got off the tracks. So we're going to go back in time. Now we're nearing the end of the book. Praise the Lord. I am ready for this series to be packed up and only found on the internet and no longer in my office or mine. I mean, think of it. Next week we're going to be studying a cut up concubine. Yeah, pray for me, okay? That's next week. So I see the end and I'm like, come on, let's get there. This is, this is a crazy book. But nonetheless, it's teaching us what we should be like as followers of Christ and leaders in the worlds in which we've been placed. There are three main characters you're going to see in this passage that I'm about to read. Three main characters. Micah, say it with me, Micah. His mom, say it with me, his mom, and then the Danites. Who is it? The Danites. Micah, mom, and Danites. These are the three different people that we see are characters at play here within the next two chapters. All of them, all of them, every bit of them, is not to be idolized. There is nothing positive that I can say about any of the three of these characters. But it stands as a warning for us. The godless leaders end up in a godless culture. And so we will unpack them as a warning for our own soul, but then we'll get back to, okay, so then how do we live? These three characters yield way to three stories. You see Micah and his mom in the first six verses in this crazy little episode. We'll unpack that. Then you see Micah and this Levite, this priest, And then we see the story of the Danites in chapter 18. So let's dive in, and we're going to go through this. Keep your Bibles open, your minds open, and most importantly, your hearts open. Let's see what God has for us today. Verse 1 of Judges 17. There was a man in the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, The 1,000 pieces of silver that were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse and also spoke it in my ears, behold, the silver is with me. I took it. Okay. Wow. We're diving right into the episode here. Here's a man who stole 1,100 pieces of silver from his own mom. And mom curses the person who steals, stole this silver from her. Now, this is a significant amount of silver. We're going to see later in the passage, Micah offers to pay a salary, annual salary, of 10 pieces of silver. So this is a lot of money in context to the time that they're in. And this dude stole it from his own mother. And his mom then curses whoever stole the money. He hears about it and finally afraid of her curse, says, it was me, mom. I did it. And then look at what the mom says, the end of verse two. And his mother said to him, blessed be my son by the Lord. Okay. And he restored the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother. And his mother said, I dedicate the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son to make a carved image and a metal image. Now, therefore, I will restore it to you So when he restored the money to his mother, his mother took 200 pieces of silver and gave it to the silversmith who had made it in a carved image and a metal image, and it was in the house of Micah. And the man, Micah, had a shrine, and he made an ephod of the household of God and ordained one of his sons who became his priest. There is so much wrong in these five verses. Let me just unpack it for you by character. First, you have Micah. If you know Hebrew, if you know what that name means, that name literally means who is like Yahweh. That's a cool name. Who is like Yahweh? That's what the name Micah means. Well, it points to Micah's parents' faith. They believed that there was no other God like Yahweh, which is ironic because Micah, who is like Yahweh, he ends up making all these other images or false gods or smaller gods and religion. The author's doing something here by making sure that we know his name and we know that he's doing something opposite of what his parents and his lineage would have embraced. Okay, that's profound. You have the mother here who confesses that uh, she has cursed whoever stole the 1,100 pieces of silver by then trying to reverse it, saying, bless my son. Don't curse him. He's my son, my pride and joy. He didn't mean to do it. It probably was a weak moment. Bless him 
Yahweh. She asks the Lord, the one true God of Israel, to bless him. Now, in the original language, she actually says, because he has come forward, verse 3, I will completely restore. It is a full restoration of this money to the Lord. She says, I will completely dedicate or completely restore this 1,100 pieces of silver to the Lord. Hmm. She said that? Okay, well, let's read down. Verse 4, his mother took how many pieces of silver? 200. 200. That's like 900 that she kept in her pocket. She did not do what she said she would do. She's holding back from the Lord. And then, not only that, these 200 pieces of silver are taken and given to a silversmith who is going to make a carved image. Now, you can see several times just in these five verses, this phrase used up in verse 3, carved image, metal image. Down at the end of verse 4, carved image, metal image. All of this, the author is trying to say, they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. Ah, ah, ah. Alarms should be sounding. Any good reader of the Bible knows that God had made it clear in his Ten Commandments and elsewhere that we are to worship only one God. And in fact, very specifically, Exodus chapter 20 verse 4 through 5, as well as Deuteronomy chapter 5, 8 and 9, after telling us to worship only one God, it says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything in heaven or above. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I am the Lord your God, and I am a jealous God. He'd already said that. So they are right here doing exactly what he said not to do. In fact, verse 5, making a shrine, took an ephod, which is this priestly gear that should have only been in the tabernacle. He makes an ephod. He makes this household of gods. He ordains his own son to become a priest and sets up his own little representation of the one true God. You might say these aren't false gods. They are gods to praise the one true God. Right. But God made it clear there is only one God. We don't have other gods. We don't have replicas of the one true God. We don't create anything to remind us of the one true God. The one true God is set apart. It's like worshiping a a bad picture of someone, right? He's saying, I don't want any bad pictures. I've posted things on Instagram before, even recently. And Molly's like, really? Did you have to post that picture? Like, that's not the most flattering picture. Or I'll say the same thing back to her, right? We don't want certain images out of it. And I'm like, oh, you look fine. You look great. It's just fine. That's how God feels about these images. Don't put something up that makes me look less than I am. Don't put something up that is a bad representation of me. Micah does exactly exactly what God said not to do. So he sets up this this worship center, verse 5. You can see in verse 24, if you want to peek over there, he sets up this house of Micah. It's a worship center to the one true God, but it's a bad representation of God. They shouldn't be worshiping other idols. And there was only one place, the tabernacle, where God was to be worshiped. No other place. Yet he's setting up all of this here. Then we have this priest language. This is actually the first chapter. I was verifying it this week, flipping all through. This is the first chapter where we see religious individuals, religious leaders mentioned in the book of Judges. Up to this point, we haven't had Levites and we haven't had priests, people that are set apart for God. Now we saw Samson was supposed to have a Levitical law up on him. He was supposed to abide by certain things to be set apart and used for God. Obviously he misused that. But here we see priests mentioned for the first time. And this man sets up his own son as a priest. But the best that we know, they're not Levites. Micah's not a Levite. The best that we know, he shouldn't be taking someone from his own household and saying, now this will be the mediator between me and God. There was only one group of people that were supposed to be that. That was the Levites. They were to be the priests. But he's like, hey, I don't have a priest. But I got a lot of carved images. Some things made out of metal. Hey, sonny boy, why don't you be our priest? So he moves him to mediator between God and man. And once again, 
disobeys the Lord. Let me just catalog all the things I see here in this passage, at least four things that are blatant disobedience to God's command. First, stealing. He stole from his mom and then his mom stole from God. Second, idolatry. False worship to Yahweh through false gods. Cursing. She curses. The mom curses. She's stepping in and playing God. The Bible tells us not to do that. And then this syncretism, this combining of false religions with the truth. The Bible makes it very clear that we're not to do that either. Some commentators have said that in chapter 17 alone, all 10 of the Ten Commandments are broken. If that's true, then Micah and his mama, they got after all 10 of them and snapped them in half. I, I can see that. I can see a case made that they broke all of these. Even disrespecting your parents, the way that he did what he did to his mom by stealing from her. He breaks that commandment. I mean, we could go on down the list. There's nothing godly about these two people. So what do we do with that? Well, I think the first warning sign is this. If you're taking notes, you should write it down. Godlessness brings the discipline of the Lord. They will be disciplined. God has to stand to what he said. He has to discipline them for their disobedience. Now listen to me. Discipline and love are not antithetical. They are not opposed to each other. One functions out of the other. The reason that discipline exists from God to us or us to our children or on down the line is because we love them and we want to teach them or God loves us and he wants to teach us. Our duty is to not rebuke the discipline of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 11 and 12 says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves. He will rattle our cage. He will get our attention. Real love has to be stern. It has to come in and and say, listen, you, you can't just keep indulging yourself in sin. You must stop. God is not to be thought of as some overindulgent parent who continues to spoil his children. He doesn't love them enough to stop them. That's not our God. He cannot tolerate sin. He cannot tolerate His children really hurting themselves, continually pressing against his character, and so he will discipline them. What's the discipline that he's getting after in Micah's life, in the lives of those in the book of Judges? What sin is it that he's not tolerating? It's captured for us in verse 6. It says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Wow. Wow. The very thing that he's disciplining is this idea that they're right. They're doing all things right in their own eyes. And he's trying to shake them and say, listen, what feels right to you, what you continue to rationalize and excuse away, it's not right in my eyes. And I must discipline you to get your attention. I wrote this down in the margins of my Bible this week. Godlessness is doing what's right in your own eyes. You are godless when you are constantly living for your own brushes of the flesh or for your own appeasement. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that seems right to man, but that way leads to death. We live in a culture, my friends, that embodies verse 6 of chapter 17. In the very end of this book, it says the same thing. The very last verse of chapter 21, it says they continued to do what was right in their own eyes. That's the world we live in. We do what feels best to us. Everybody is embracing what feels best to them. As I mentioned last week, we as Christians, we don't change our feelings and then hope that our actions follow. We change our actions and hope that our feelings follow. We have to be obedient, not just doing what feels right, because that will lead to death. And if it isn't physical death, it's some kind of spiritual death or discipline from the Lord, where he will finally say, listen, it can't be this way. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but my feelings are so strong, God. I want it this way. No, 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 no. But my way is better. Trust my way. And he will get our attention, even if it means he has to discipline us. The problem that these guys were facing in verse 6, and we see it in verse 1 of chapter 18 as well, is that there was no leadership. There were no kings in Israel. That was, in fact, their discipline. There was anarchy and chaos. Remember, these stories happened prior to all of the judges we've already learned about and studied. So if that statement would have been given to us in the prologue at the beginning, maybe we would have made more sense of all of the corrupt judges. Anarchy. Chaos. But the author shows us the craziness and then comes back and says, there was no king. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. This was their discipline. With that, the story continues. Verse 7 through 13. Let me kind of summarize it and unpack it for you a little bit at a time here. There's this young man who now shows up on the scenes. Verse 7, a young man from Bethlehem in Judah of the family of Judah who was a Levite and he sojourned there. And the man departed from the town of Bethlehem Bethlehem in Judah to sojourn where he could find a place. and And as he journeyed, he came to the hill country of Ephraim to the house of Micah. Okay, so we have an unnamed, we don't know his name, uh, unnamed Levite, a priest, traveling from Bethlehem due north, seemingly looking for trouble, or at least what is easy. He wants to leave the other Levites. He's not going to where the temple would have been resting in Shiloh. He's wandering by himself. And you're going to see this Levite ends up only doing what is easy. He's a pushover. He's a cow on ice, easily pushed to or fro, wherever he wants to go or whatever popular opinion is before him. Verse 10, he shows up at Micah's house and Micah says, stay with me and be to me a father and a priest and I will give you 10 pieces of silver a year and a suit of clothes and your living. And the Levite went in. So this Levite says, sure, that sounds nice. You'll take me in? I can be your priest? Well, remember, he had already promoted his son to priest. So now we have ensuing chaos where this young person, a young man, verse 7, is now going to be made like the father, he says in verse 10. And then you'll see uh, as 11 goes on, and the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became to him like one of his sons. It's maybe a little bit more poignant in the Hebrew, but it, basically it's saying that he, he's young and then he's like a father, and then he's like a son. And what is he? Does he have authority or is he under? Does Micah see himself as a chief priest or does he see himself under this priest? The chaos is captured for us in almost the play on words and the different words that are used to describe this, this Levite. Chaos is happening. It's the opposite of godliness. And in verse 12 and 13, we see that Micah ordains this Levite He sets him up, and then, like a lucky rabbit's foot or four-leaf clover, in verse 13, he says, Now I know that the Lord will prosper me, because I have a Levite priest. Finally, I found my golden ticket, he says. Now I will have the blessing of the Lord. No, not true. This Levite's not where he's supposed to be. You're not at the tabernacle. You have all sorts of false idols and images. The hand of God is not upon you. So, discipline. The Danites show up. This tribe of people. These people that we've read about before in the book of Joshua. We also read about them in the early part of Judges. It's a small tribe that would have been down on the coast of Israel. Maybe near where Gaza is. They were pushed out of there, and they were now pushed up north. Now, I should be clear with you. They were not pushed out necessarily. They chose not to fight. Judges chapter 1 and 2 told us that they were supposed to fight the Amorites and take the land there on the coast, but they chose to disobey. We'll go the easy route. We'll go up north, and we'll find an easier place to stay. So, verse 1, in those days there was no king in Israel, and in those days the tribe of Dan was seeking for itself an inheritance to dwell in, for until then no inheritance among the tribes of Israel had fallen to them. Not true. They had been given something by Joshua. 
but they chose not to take it. Verse 2, so the people of Dan sent five able men from the whole number of their tribe. They send five spies to go up and try to find a place for them to dwell. They come to the house of Micah, pick up with me in verse 3. When they're by the house of Micah, they recognize the voice of a young Levite. And they turn aside to him and said, who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? What is your business here? And he said to them, this is how Micah dwelt with me. He has hired me and I have become his priest. They're leaderless. They're looking for comfortable, but they also want to have the favor of God. They were worshiping false gods most likely, but they still believed in the one true God. So they come across this serene place up north, no battles to fight. And then they hear this Levite talk and they're like, wait a second, that sounds familiar. We, it says in verse 3 that they recognized his voice. Why? Had they met this young guy before? No, most likely he had an accent. He's from the South. You know how that is. Some people from the South have a little bit of twang in their, their talk. They say words all the time like y'all, and they can't help but say y'all. They can't say you guys for the life of them. They just say y'all. When I go to Israel, there's these plaques that are sell, sold down there in Main Street, Jerusalem that say shalom y'all. Shalom y'all. I love it. My Texas or South friends, my, my Georgia friends, shalom, y'all, right? Tennessee, Kentucky, that's, that's the kind of accent that he had. He's talking, they're like, wait, I recognize that. The little twang in his voice, whatever it was. And there in that moment, they say, he's ours. They try to take him. You see how this guy's being swapped around like a four-leaf clover? Like a, a lucky marble or a rabbit's foot? They, they try to take him so that they can have access to God. In verse 6, they ask for him to inquire, excuse me, verse 5, inquire to God, please, that we may know whether the journey on which we are settling will succeed. They want to know, are we on the right path? Come on, Levite, give us the blessing of the Lord. And the priest said to them, go in peace, the journey on which you go is under the eye of the Lord. <laughs> I was in the basement this week. I read that verse and I go, liar, liar, liar. Right? I'm like, he can't say that. He, first of all, he's given a thousand different reasons on why we shouldn't trust this guy. And then he acts like a false prophet in verse six, go in peace. The journey on which you are on is under the eye of God. I mean, I guess in some ways he's not lying. God's eye was definitely on them. What they were doing was exactly against what Joshua told them to do. In Joshua 19, they were supposed to settle on the coast. In Judges chapter 1, we're told that they were supposed to take over that area, but didn't fight the Amorites. In Deborah's song, in Judges chapter 5, we're told that Dan was one of the reluctant tribes. If this Levi would have had his mind about him, he would have said, no, 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 you guys are actually in the wrong. You need to turn around. You need to go back to the land that was, that was allotted to you. But he gives them these words of false hope, and so they go on and try to conquer a safe land. I've been to Laish. It's renamed Dan. It's a beautiful place. I take my tours there whenever we go to Israel. I took a video recently when I was there of just this beautiful waterfall. The water, the headwaters of the Jordan are flowing all throughout there. The waterfalls are amazing. They have these bridge walks where you can walk along the waterfalls. And our tour will we'll walk along those waterfalls and reflect on the beauty. The greenery, the bushes, the trees. Oh, it's amazing. It's one of my favorite places because it's secure. It's quiet. It's easy, it's serene, the views are beautiful. It's the same thing they would have thought, the tribe of Dan, when they showed up. Ah, oh, this is the place. This is where we should settle. So they go in to take it. Verse 7, 14 through 17 of chapter 18. You can see there the story. They, they go in and they try to take it, specifically 600 of them in verse 16. Now 600 men of the Danites armed with their weapons of war stood by the entrance of the gate. They're taking it from some people, some Philistines that would have dwelt there. And then five men 
who had gone to scout out the land, went up and entered to take the carved image, the ephod, the household of gods, and the metal images, while the priest stood at the entrance of the gate with the 600 men armed with the weapons of war. Okay, so let me just make sure you understand what's happening. They find the beautiful, serene place. This is our new home, they start thinking. Let's stay here. They get the troops, 600 of them, to take over this unwalled city, They're standing there at the entrance, ready to take over the land, make it their own. They say, this is so beautiful. We should set up a worship center here. We should never go back and worship at Shiloh or wherever the tabernacle is. Let's just stay here. It's so beautiful. Have you ever been there like on a vacation or something? You're you're just enjoying everything. You're like, "We we should buy a place here. We should never go back. We should stay here for all of eternity, right? That's what they were thinking. Go get those things we saw at Micah's house. Bring them up here. And let's, let's build a worship center right here. Verse 17, that, the ephod, that carved image. We'll make this shrine of God, the household of God, right here so that we never have to leave The pursuit of taking from Micah what is his is then captured for us in 18 through 24. You can see it for yourself. They show up at Micah's house. They take the carved image, the ephod, the household of the gods, the metal image. The priest says to them, so the Levite's still hanging out at Micah's, what are you doing? And they said to him, keep quiet. Put your hand on your mouth and come with us to to be to us a father and a priest. It's Is it better for you to be a priest to the household of one man? Like, do you want to just stay here with Micah? Or do you want to be a priest to the whole tribe and clan of Israel? This young priest hears this. He's like, oh, this is good. My heart is glad. In verse 20, it says, his heart was glad. So he took the ephod, took the household of the gods, the carved images, and he went along with the people. Cow on ice. Pushed easily. Now follows them, and this is all Micah's loss. They turned and departed, putting the little ones and the livestock and the goods in front of them. When they had gone a distance from the home of Micah, the men who were in the house near Micah's house called out, and they overtook the people of Dan. So now we see a schoolyard battle going on. Verse 24, Micah's getting upset. He said, you take my gods that I made and the priest, and you go away, what will I have left? He's all wrong in this. His gods are not everything to him. His priest is nothing to him. It's a made-up mockery of the tabernacle and true worship to God. Here's something I think is worth scribbling down. I wrote it right here in the side of my Bible. The gods you make up are not gods at all. He made up these gods. He made up these things that he wanted to worship. Why are you taking my ball? Don't take my ball, right? That's my ball. No, what is it to you that we take your ball? And they're having this fight all the way through verse (laughs) 6. You can even see it. They keep saying, what does it matter to you? No, what's it matter to you? Childish. They're fighting over something that's not real, that won't bring them hope, that's absolutely godless. They had so given themselves over to this and their affections over to these false gods that it was going to cost them everything. Micah gives up in verse 26. He realizes he's outnumbered. He turns and he goes home and he lets the priest and the idols go with the Danites. His consequence was that he lost what he thought he had, peace with God. The consequence for the Danites is they will eventually be captured by the Assyrians and they will lose all peace. Their godlessness cost them everything. Here's something worth writing down. Godlessness lies to you. And it tells you that it will cost you nothing. But in the end, it costs you everything. Godlessness will tell you it's not that big of a deal. Follow your passions. Go with it. It's not going to cost you your life. It lies to you. 
Godliness is the only thing that brings us life. We lay our life down to gain it in Christ. In the end, if you give yourself over to a godless life, it will take everything you've got for all of eternity. Daniel Dukes was a a young man who was struggling with all sorts of things in his life, an abuse of alcohol, an abuse of drugs. He had a minor brush with the law. He was in Orlando, and one night, probably induced by alcohol and drugs, he decided that he wanted to go swimming. Unfortunately, he decided that it would be most fun for him to swim with a whale. So he snuck into SeaWorld, and he found the killer whale tank. He removed all of his clothes, and he jumped in. The next morning, the employees found his dead body in the water, and they did a full autopsy in the weeks to follow, and later it showed that he had died of hypothermia and drowning. His parents sued SeaWorld. They said it was SeaWorld's fault because they had made the killer whale a friendly, people-loving, kind of looking creature. Apparently, the title Killer Whale and locking SeaWorld from people getting in wasn't enough to convince them that it wasn't actually safe for people. The parents did end up dropping their lawsuit. But my friends, that tragic example is just another example of how prone people can be to warnings, to ignore warnings in their life, to simply do what feels good in the moment and then blame everybody else. It will cost you your life. Godlessness will cost you your life. Verse 27, the people of Dan took what Mike had made, the priests who belonged to him, they came to Leash, to these people that were quiet and unsuspecting, they took over them, struck them with the edge of the sword, killed them, burned them, which is actually breaking a, a rule of war. Biblically speaking, they burned the city with fire. They took over, set up the carved images for themselves, all to have a life of what they thought would be easy. I've sat up there at the temple at the top of Dan. The remains still are there. I've sat there and I've taught our groups about the call of Christianity is not always easy. It demands your life. There at the top of Dan is this erected temple under this Levite's Supervision, we could guess. There is this metal frame that represents what the altar would have been like. They set up their own altar like what was at the tabernacle. It wasn't supposed to be there, but they set it up because it was easy. We don't have to go anywhere. It's right here. There's even a place over on the side where you can see the priest would have had his own office, his own place to prepare himself for the sacrifices. You can see all the remains that there, they, they didn't worship Elohim, they worshiped what in Hebrew is called Shedahim. It is demons. It's the same word we use for idols. This word in the Hebrew is saying they didn't worship the one true God, they worshiped false gods, lower gods, even the little demons that they had set up in their life. That's what they worshiped, all because they thought life would be easier up there. Godlessness tells you life will be easier, but it takes from you everything. Godlessness, my friends, when it comes to Christianity, is a commitment to ease. And Christianity is not easy. Think about it. At the center of our belief system is the death of our Savior. He died. He was crucified for our sins. He was ridiculed. He was persecuted and everyone who's come after him. And he said in John chapter 16, verse 33, uh, listen, you will have many tribulations, but take heart. I have overcome the world. It shouldn't be surprising to us that the call of Christianity is easy. Yet for some, they seem so sh- that it isn't easy. For some, it seems so shocked. How, how is it so hard? Why all this suffering in the Christian life? Because we're not home yet. Pursuing God calls for hard work, diligent obedience, loyalty, and faithfulness 
as a way of life. If anybody should have known that, it should have been this priest. Let me surprise you with something that the author does for us. We didn't know his name. We knew nothing about him until the very end of this chapter, verse 30. And the people of Dan set up the carved images for themselves. And, drum roll please, Jonathan, the son of Gresham, son of Moses. Wow, what? This is the grandson of Moses. This Levite was unnamed to the end to have a move that bus kind of moment for the readers and to all of a sudden go, what? This is the grandson of Moses? We're just a couple generations away from the very one who was given the commandments of God, who was speaking on behalf of God. And this guy, this guy chose to live a life opposite of how God wanted us to live. And sure enough, after that, it says that they lived in the land until they were taken captive, which was the Assyrian siege, the the Assyrian captivity, which happened 300 years later. Maybe they had a season of ease, but Jonathan should have known better. Following God calls for hard things. Why did he give in? And then discipline came, and they were taken captive by Assyria. As if the author hasn't made it big enough with revealing the name of this priest. He then tells us that they were not that far from Shiloh. Look at verse 31. So they set up Micah's carved images that he had made as long as the house of God was at Shiloh. The tabernacle, we know where Shiloh was. It dwelt there for 300 years. I've driven past it. I've seen the place where it was in the West Bank. They were not that far from having an authentic, unhindered, obedient relationship with God, but they chose what was easy instead of what was right. Next time you're on a road trip through Kansas, I'm going to encourage you to stop by Greensburg, Kansas, and see the largest hand-dug well in the world. That's right, this well is dug into the ground, 100 feet down, 30 feet in diameter. They have an entire visitor center because there's nothing else to do out there. So you can go and you can see this for yourself. No offense, my Kansas friends, but not that far from Wichita, about six hours from here, you can go see this amazing well, 100 feet in depth, 30 feet wide, through limestone rock dug by hand. This well reminds me that the Bible tells us that we are to continue to dig and dig a deep well, not into human wisdom, but then into God's wisdom. We dig and we dig and we dig and it is hard work. And sadly, there are plenty of people that will give you easy advice and will tell you, here's how to have a peace of mind. But the only true peace in our mind, P-E-E, A-C-E, that we desire so badly that that peace can only come from God himself giving us his counsel and telling us how to live. Proverbs 20 verse 5 says, counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. We don't even know how to understand our own hearts. So we dig deep wells and we ask the Lord, please show me what it means to be fully dependent upon you. I want to give you two pieces of application out of this passage. Number one is this. Growing in godliness means that you must grow in Christ-likeness. This passage stands as a warning. Don't be like these guys, godless, but be godly. A lazy heart, a lazy Christian heart will be full of complaints, will be full of discontentment. But my friends, an active heart, digging deep into the well of God, will be content, will find all that it needs in him and in him alone. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 and 12 says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, training us 
to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. This verse is powerful. God has given us his grace. He's already brought us salvation. But that salvation daily trains us in godliness, renouncing ungodly worldly passions and living godly lives in this present age. If you want to live a godly life, in a culture much like what the judges would have experienced, then you will trust that Christ and all of his goodness will continue to direct you towards an obedient, not always easy kind of life. The second thing I want to encourage you with today is this. The road to reconciliation with God is paved with repentance. You may say, well, I'm pretty far from the Lord. And I've let some things get off the rails in my life. I got a mess spilled all over the highway of my life. And I say, okay, the road back is one of repentance. It's changing your mind, changing your thinking, and following him with everything in you. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9 says, As it is, I rejoice, not because you are grieved, but because you are grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly fear so that you suffered no loss through us. He He uses this phrase twice, godly grief. It's beautiful in the original language. It's this idea of your soul being wrung out and not sorrowful because you were caught, but sorrowful because you're ready to change and you never want to go back. Reconciliation with God is paved by repentance. It's you saying, I'm going to do life differently. I'm not going back there. I'm changing my ways. According to a recent study, 48% of us, certainly not me, 48% of us don't use our blinkers when we should. Okay, me, I definitely do that. 48% of drivers fail to use their signal when they're changing lanes or at some corners that they're used to. Nearly half of that 48% just say they don't have time to hit their blinker, and 23% say they were too lazy And the rest say they simply forget. And so the study revealed that over 2 million accidents happen a year because people don't use their blinkers. Maybe it's time, my friends, for us to use our spiritual blinkers. Change lanes, change direction, change lifestyle. Repentance is changing. Maybe it's time for us to use our spiritual blinkers and avoid a catastrophe with the Lord. May we be godly people. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you do allow us to know you, allow us to have a sweet relationship with you. God, I pray that you will help guide us in the days ahead, that we will be people who are fully dependent upon you, godly in the way that we live. May we walk in a manner worthy of the gospel that you have given us to save our souls. And will you help us please bring glory to you in doing so. In the name of Christ we pray and all God's people said, amen.